we have some panelists. I'm going to let them introduce themselves this week. Um, ladies first, I'm going to start with Dasha. Hi everyone, this is Dasha. I'm um, CISO and um, co-owner of, um, co-founder of uh, Stealth Group. I've uh, been in the industry for over 20 years. A lot of expertise in data privacy, especially when it comes to international data transfers and regulatory compliance around that. So excited to, uh, uh, to share some ideas, thoughts, and questions around the group. Fantastic, thank you for that. Then Age Before Beauty, so uh, Leighton, you're up. Thank you. <laughs> uh, my name is Leighton Johnson. I am the CTO of Information Security Forensics Management Team. I've been a privacy assessor, privacy consultant, and privacy engineer for a good 25 years, maybe even longer. Um, I have had both national and international exposure to privacy requirements and worked in a multitude of areas, both in the U.S. and overseas. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Jim, you're up. Well, if I'm beauty in this equation, you've really got a problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jim Frangione, I'm an advisor for Blue Coat presently, uh, which is a, uh, a security firm for small uh, and medium-sized businesses to aid in uh, doing internal wrongdoing investigations, uh, risk assessments, and such. And I've uh, been, geez, got about a 30-year career starting in the military, uh, some federal law enforcement experience, uh, as well as time in private sector for the better part of 20 years, uh, primarily working in the areas of, um, uh, of security operations, uh, both on the cyber side and on the physical security side, uh, using data transformation to, uh, um, to, to help those programs along and to become uh, more targeted towards the crimes of the 21st century and, and less the 20th century. Um, obviously, privacy plays a huge role in that. We do a lot of coordination in all of those roles. Um, with privacy office, with compliance office, with legal, um, so that there's a lot of uh, a lot of things happening, especially now in the privacy space. As this is becoming a, a much more prescient topic uh, in, in, in you know 2020 than it has been in a very long time. Yes, yeah, agreed. But we we are expecting another panelist, but he hasn't arrived yet. So as and when he arrives, he can introduce himself. Okay, so thank you everyone that submitted questions just to get us started. Um, those questions are on slido.com. Uh, if you wanted to look at those or you wanted to submit questions, assuming we get to those, because there's, there's quite a packed uh, set of questions today, uh, the code that you need on slido.com is 54734. And thanks again to those that submitted. Um, as always, my, my plea to you guys that we, we want to keep this interactive. This is not a lecture. It's not intended to be a lecture. It's a load of folks that know what they're talking about, discussing things so that uh, sharing the wisdom. So uh, if there's any way, uh, if you're not shy and you, you would like to turn your camera on, that would be fantastic. Just so that uh, it's, it's for better for the presenters, really, for the, uh, for the panelists, just to see that um, you're engaged. Otherwise, it becomes really quite, you know, we've, we've all done this. It can become quite a struggle uh, if you can't see uh, folks listening to you and, and what they're up to. So. so given that, they're the kind of rules of the game. That's it. No sales pitch. Um, you just won't get one here. So if you did want to talk about anything related to that, then contact myself, Dash, or any of the panelists. We'd be very glad to help you. But otherwise, we're not pushing any products. We're not selling any services here. This is pure insight. Uh, and knowledge sharing from uh, from folks that have been doing this for a very long time. So, without further ado, then uh, start your engines because the first question is a doozy. Um, how has 2020 changed the way we should think about data privacy? This is a question about 2020 and the way that uh, and stuff has happened and and how should that affect our thinking about data privacy? My assumption is this is about COVID and potentially the elections in the US. Um, but if you wanted to add, it, add any other kind of context to that while you answer the question, absolutely fine. So I'm, I'm looking for volunteers at this point. I'm not, not pointing at anyone. Somebody volunteer to take this one, please. I'll give it a go. Okay. Um, so I think 2020, um, not so much. I think I would put the time frame when it all really started and became an issue probably about three years ago, um, especially with all the large companies starting to collect cookies, starting to sell it to third parties. And that's where a lot of um, uh, 
um, a lot of fines were issued, but also a lot of consumers started to really speak up and be concerned about where is my data really going? So I would, um, I personally, I'm not seeing a lot of changes in 2020 with the exception of a uh, few rules like California, their, their privacy law is starting to take effect uh, next year. They're also trying to push a few more, more stringent requirement to data privacy. So I, I think this, um, I think it's just, it, just something that's happening and has been and will continue. Um, from a COVID perspective, what happened this year, I don't think it had much of an impact um, for, for the consumer. Actually, let me ask you a question at this point though. So the whole COVID thing had a big impact on where people work. And there's probably a question about this later on. So, um, you know, let, let's labor the point here. There are a couple of COVID questions. Um, is, is, what is the impact on the whole world of data, data privacy from the context of folks now working from home? Anything? Um, so I think for the small businesses where they're located in one particular country, um, with COVID, it does not really have much impact. I see it more of the international and remote work, but that has been in place even before COVID. So like big, large international corporations, they had staff in India, they had staff in Europe. They had so with that being said, they were not impacted with COVID. It was part of their business and the problems they had with it before, and they continue having it. So. Um, is there a, where is your data actually going if you're working on your, um, on your, bring your own, or uh, bring your own device and working remotely? I hope not because the business processes should be still the same. Uh, so does, is company data or individual data being stored and bring your own devices? Um, probably, but I hope not. I hope some companies still use um, their databases, their enterprise solutions to host it, house it, and hopefully that is um, in those countries where it should be and not just being moved around across the board in the cloud where, wherever it's convenient. I think uh, we've noticed that there was a period of time when during this, the, the rush to work from home that perhaps there was a, there was a weakness when it came to, to enterprise data. Um, but I think we've, we've seen that um, companies have recognized that and have put solutions in place. It's been six months now. I don't see, uh, uh, I think that gap has been pretty much closed. <clears throat> okay, did anyone else? Josh is saying there, I think from the standpoint of data security, uh, company data, I, I think, you know, especially financial services, this is stuff that they have been working for years to prepare for anyway, right? In terms of their, their continuity of business and making sure endpoint security is in place and such. Um, but I do think, you know, from standpoint of COVID, I think Dash is right, but we have also seen, you know, people rush to other applications that we've not used before. I think, you know, Zoom was something that, you know, uh, was nowhere being used nowhere near the scale it's being used now. And if you look at that from the standpoint of personal information, it's another point um, where we're giving information to some entity uh, that we you know, may or may not know what they do with that personal information, whether it just be your name, your age, whatever it is, right, to, uh, to get an account with Zoom. So there is some personal, um, I think, from a data privacy standpoint, there are new, uh, just as this threat surface has increased by everybody being remote, there's new applications in that threat surface that, uh, that may present some challenges for the individual, maybe less for the company, as Dash is saying, but uh, certainly for the individual whose personal information is out there. I also add, I think 2020 is going to be an important year. Um, you know, in, in hindsight, I think we may look back at it. I think this whole COVID situation, as well as a documentary like The Social Dilemma, has brought a ton of awareness to how um, your data is being used uh, for you and against you. Um, you know, highlighting what, you know, the Cambridge Analytica situation and how that stuff can be leveraged and sold. Um, you know, we see GDPR, we have California, Texas is coming online. I, I, you know, it's just a matter of time before more states and maybe even the United States uh, finds themselves um, looking to what GDPR uh, did for the EU. And I think this is a place where we really, it's not a time for any of the professionals to duck their head in the sands. If you're not familiar with GDPR, 
you should probably get familiar with it because that stuff is coming here, whether you think so or not, it's going to be here, uh, maybe in some form, you know, whether it's state by state or, 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 uh, or federally, um, uh, there, there's going to be stuff that's coming this way and it's, it's just time, a matter of time. Yeah. Uh, that's a you know, segment. we're Sorry. seeing 27 countries and six states who've added privacy laws in the last 12 months, plus GDPR. So, you know, it, it's a it's a spread, you know, some are, you know, twice as stringent as GDPR. When you go and look at some of the ones in the Far East, you look at the ones in South Asia, um, you know, even Africa starting to come online because I was talking to people yesterday who are in Lagos and Nigeria is thinking about it and things like that. So everybody's focused on data privacy now. I think the work from home scenario under COVID sort of just accentuated the issue rather than brought it to the forefront. Um, I think with the advent of GDPR three years ago or two years ago, and now it's moving forward with all the other organizational efforts and national efforts around the world that everything is now focusing on those areas, you know? And even from a standard view within IT departments and those types of things, it all has changed because now you've got extra areas you have to concern besides just security, okay? Because privacy brings on a whole new realm of additional areas in conjunction with security, because privacy, of course, is around confidentiality, but it certainly has other components too, like manageability and the whole thing about, you know, the right to be forgotten under GDPR and CCPA. And that's yeah. a whole nother area that yeah. adds to it. And then there's the personal focus. It's the individual rather than the organization that you have to be aware of in the privacy side too. And so the awareness has gone up dramatically for everybody. You know, uh, the whole change on the federal side around cookies on the U.S., that's another area that's starting to, to you know, change in those efforts. You know, I mean, the U.S. government has been dealing with cookies since 1999. They had, that was their first time they put anything in play for it. Now, all of that's getting rewritten uh, because of all the changes. And so... We see that 2020 is, is advancing the privacy scenario for everybody, legally in some reasons and drivers, other ones are personal, you know, we're still getting a breach a week, so we still have that going on, you know, as far as data getting released when it shouldn't be and et cetera, and finding companies who are using the data that in ways they're not set up to use, you know, appropriately that we all have to pay attention to. So I don't think that COVID really was a major driver in privacy, but I think it accentuated the areas that needed to be focused that, as Dasha said, started three years ago, four years ago. You know, I mean, 2016 is when they passed GDPR and they gave everybody two years to put it in, you know, yeah. so it's actually started back, you know, in those arenas so this has been building for probably five to six years because they worked and discussed it in the eu for two years before they ever passed it you know yeah. that type of thing so i think the exposure area is what 2020 has driven up yeah. not the need for it not the areas that were evolving but it's the awareness of it. the forefront yeah, for sure. So next time I'm good, you're coming with a spoiler alert because you've just given away the whole agenda now. <laughs> but uh, you, a, a question sprung to my mind. So the whole cookie issue is a, is a federal one, okay? Uh -huh. Whereas the states individually are dealing with their data privacy regulations. So A, why is that? And B, because a lot of folks watching this don't actually realise that America is a is a is not one single country it is joined up with multiple different states they're joined at the kind of military federal level and some government but otherwise the states pretty much govern themselves uh, simplistically and let's not make this a political question so yes california has come up with something very similar to gdpr texas is nearly there you've got other states looking at this as well why is this being treated at the state level and not the federal level in the u.s 
I got to think it's because nothing can get done in Congress if we're trying to stay um, non-political, uh, you know, but look, I mean, the, the realities are, you know, we are polarized politically here and there's not been a lot of momentum on this. You know, it even goes beyond that, James, on the polarization. There have been privacy laws introduced in the United States Congress virtually every year for the last 25 years. Okay. And none of them have ever passed. All right. Yeah. We have data breach reporting requirements that are all state based. So we got yeah. 54 because we've got 54 states and territories reporting requirements. We only have one national requirement and that's on health information exclusively. Yeah. And that's yeah. it. We don't have it on any other mechanism. There has always been discussions on what constitutes levels, what constitutes sizes, how much is going to be a national reporting requirement. And a lot of that has to do with, of course, entities in the United States, otherwise known as companies, are viewed as individual rights holders just as much as individuals are. And because of that mechanism that's in place within our legal structure, at those areas, we can't get consensus. Okay. Uh, and that's the big reason. Latent. I look at the structure of con getting something, they say getting well, true. Congress is an act of Congress, right? I mean, structurally, those things take longer in general, I think. Uh, uh, but the rate you know, you're dealing with uh, here? Our security laws that we have put in place, you know, have taken anywhere from three to five years to get through the process to become law. You know, as we have seen historically with, you know, FISMA and the Computer Fraud Act and all those. I mean, those took, you know, anywhere from three to five to seven years to get through that activity because of the fact that our legal system requires a relative consensus in order to get it all the way through. No matter which side of the fence you're on. It, it agrees, needs right? consensus. It, it's and a structural thing, issue. right, that it typically takes a long time at a federal yes. level. I think it goes to say it's just faster to have it done at the state level. and that, But that brings me Right. Up. And so, obviously, they had needs for each state to step in oh. on data breach reporting let requirements. Me, let, me, let me give you a question on a particular state then. So, so California, the People's Republic mm -hmm. of California has its own GDPR uh, legislation. Yep. How does that apply to me? Do I have to be born there? Is it the, the company um, domiciled there has my data? Am I passing through? Do I it is there? literally the same as GDPR. It has to do with a citizen of the state's information. Right. Okay. So uh, like GDPR has to do with an EU citizen's personal data. CCPA yeah. has to do with a consumer in the state of California. Consumer, right. resident, consumer of a location or a state citizen, one or the other. Right. Right. And that's, that's the thing about CCPA that's a little bit different than anybody right. else's. But then that's California's viewpoint anyway, because they did it with their Data Privacy Reporting Act. That's why everybody looks to California is right. because it has to do with if you bought something from a location in California, no matter where you are, it and that particular data gets released, they have to tell everybody. Not just you, but everybody. Right. And that's the data breach view that California has taken in okay. place. I don't know if it's because Silicon Valley's there, or if they have a whole lot of very forward-thinking people, or what, or combinations thereof, but that's, they're, then their general view at, is that type of thing. But if you take a look at it, that's really hard to enforce. I mean, oh, let, right. let's, granted. <laughs> let's, let's take a look. Uh, let's take a look at even GDPR uh, or California or anything. It's really um, a lot of companies struggle with unstructured data in the first place. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, having it. Where is it? What is it? Over the last few years, we have come across a lot of data modeling and data storage solutions and data analytics. So we've come a, at least a long way to keep track of the data, but it's, I mean, just looking at a small organization and having to have a data privacy officer in place, that data privacy officer has to work with IT security. You have to have the release information. You have to know what it is you're collecting. You have to, 
and it also goes into electronics, your website. Um, I'm not sure how many websites are still out there that are not collecting any kind of information at this point. So you will either have to, if you don't even want to go into this area of data privacy, you pretty much have to be, you cannot be online or you block all IPs with the exception of that particular state or country that you're in. And so it's, I mean, I 100% I agree that there needs to be a regulation about data privacy and data storage, but there also has, it has to be enforceable because otherwise. So, saying, so that's my question. So are you saying this is so complicated? It's almost unenforceable. Let, let's use an example, right? So I'm an EU citizen and if I wanted to exercise my right to be forgotten, as an example, doesn't matter which state, because GDPR covers all that, then how do I how do I go about that? How does the company that I've requested that from go about that? And how do they provide or provide evidence or prove that they have complied fully? How does that work? Same for California. You could have the same example, right? I would, you know, I think Dasha brought up a really good point here the most mature of these things at the moment is GDPR, right? And Leighton said the same thing, right? And it's only a couple of years old. I think most folks are still figuring out a way to make, how to make that as enforceable as possible, the spirit of that law uh, enforceable. So it's still very new. I think everybody's still, you know, they know what they want, how to execute it is another thing entirely, right? Um, Leighton brings up another great point. Let's not confuse data privacy laws with information security laws, right? There, you know, look at the SHIELD Act in New York. That's more of a stopping hacks and in, in information security, making sure data stays secure. And there's a whole bunch of reporting around that stuff if there is a breach of that data. But it's not like California or GDPR in that, you know, you've got a right to be forgotten. They should be able to delete my data uh, if I don't want to be, uh, if I don't want to be, uh, included in that. Uh, it's a lot different. New York has got some other stuff coming um, that will, you know, be more privacy related, but they're not, not entirely mutually exclusive, but they're, they're really not the same thing, right? So let's not confuse some of the laws that we're seeing, like New York Shield, um, the Shield Act, uh, you know, we shouldn't confuse that with privacy either. But I, I do think there's a lot to be said here in terms of the maturity of the enforceability. Um, a lot of people are still, <laughs> there's going to be growing pains. We're still going to grow through this. This is a journey. It's not a, uh, you know, um, you know, I don't know that it's a one-stop shop. This is going to take time. So having been, been in, involved in the weeds with networks and databases, you know, if, if, uh, if somebody, you know, let's use a big multi, you know, global investment bank as an example, if you went to them and said, Hey, uh, I want to exercise my right to forgotten that person's data is resident on hundreds of systems. So I'm not sure there's a, there's a major corporate in the world anywhere that has got a handle on that. They don't even know exactly where all of it is. So proving that it's all been deleted, I think is a bridge too far right now. Do you think this will all, this, or have you seen GDPR having an impact on <clears throat> corporate information systems and their design? So now I'm going off piece, but I just wanted to follow this one a little bit. I, cer I certainly have. Uh, so a, a few years ago, and that was way even before GDPR, um, also a project we've done with different banks where they had in particular, it was a global bank, they had clients all over the place and they, we implemented a DLP system. So there you suddenly came into, well, initially it started out, well, we're going to create uh, one storage in the US, one storage in Europe, and one storage in Asia. And uh, we're going to do 24-7 around the sun a support center around it and monitoring. Well, then we came in and started looking into it. It's like, you can't do that. Just alone Switzerland, with back then, 10 years ago, had so such unique regulatory requirements that we could not even put them in the same bucket in Europe. So yeah. suddenly we had to build the infrastructure in Switzerland, infrastructure in Germany, infrastructure in multiple countries in Asia, and so on and so on. And then we also had to figure out the people who can actually, especially call centers in India, what can they access, what can they not access, and then the whole process around escalations. And very similar, a current project, global one that we're working on as well. It's a global client. They have infrastructure and technology all over the world. 
and we are in the we're looking to find engineers to actually work on those things and guess what we have a whole bunch of them in india but they can only touch the systems in the us so everybody in europe they they can't even work on it and the same thing americans cannot even though we have enough of them here cannot touch the european systems because there is no data flow around from uh, allowed anymore from europe to the us so now it's not just about technology it's about the resources the processes how do you escalate how uh, what data is really being collected that suddenly allows uh, or prohibits a regular call center from a month ago to not now still process the, the data or especially if we take a look at germany under german uh, privacy law an ip address is considered pii so, so if you so you're saying you're seeing data ar architecture globally being decentralized they have to be uh, they have to especially now that you cannot move data from U europe to the us you have to as companies you have to start spinning up your own data storage or data centers or geographic locations and service centers for those reasons and i think that's the way going forward especially as uh as new laws are being passed, um, there's there's no other way around. At least not what I can see. You know, there's no real true international standard. You know, when I worked with the global information company a couple of years ago, as we started their GDPR effort and started looking at everything, they ended up segmenting it into 28 data centers around the world because <laughs> that was the closest they could get to it being centralized. All okay? right, because of the laws then all right yeah. it's only gotten more intense now as far as those efforts go and so they literally had six data centers in different countries in europe they had you know six or seven across asia they had a couple in south america they had you know one in canada six in the u.s one in mexico etc because of the legal requirements was there a centralized control function there was but there was three it wasn't one they yeah. had to make them three in order to properly manage everything because yeah. of yeah. you know the shifting of the relationships between the eu and the us with data transfers you know um, yeah. at that time they were still working under the privacy shield of course that's now been thrown out and yeah. You know, so, uh, they were already working with Safe Harbor being thrown out, but they were looking at the new one, and now they can't, because of the laws, as Dasha says, you can't transfer that data right now between the two areas of the world. Okay. So the responsibility of the controlling function is to understand the disparate regulations in play and be the funnel, if you like, for requests for people like me that want their data yes. deleted. Okay. And that was one of the big things we worked on was this whole thing about the right to be forgotten because yeah, yeah. that's been so foreign to U.S. viewpoints around privacy that it was a totally new area for everybody who was in the U.S. But it's certainly something that has been at least talked about in other areas of the world. So they had some sense of what it meant. But like Dasha says, data modeling changes everything and now all of a sudden you have to be able to track the back mechanisms of the backups all the way back to when it was collected yeah. in order yeah. to get rid of it which means you got to go through all the archives you got to go through all the backups you know all of those things technically in order to implement that and it has nothing to do with the IT security it only has to do with IT privacy but it's a huge regulatory mechanism for these companies because of what can happen if they don't do it. Yeah, for sure. And what's, uh, what's happened in the world of fines? Has anyone been fined for being unable to uh, I've to seen react? three reports come out of Europe so far that they've been fined for unable to do the right to be forgotten or the right to erasure as it's officially called. Okay. All right. um, from, you know, the EU folks in Brussels. So I don't know. I, I know there's three of them at least that I've heard of, but 
beyond that, I don't know. You know, it's been in place now for two years. I have really not heard a lot of that. They're still mostly focusing on the breach side of GDPR more mm -hmm. than they are about the other seven tenets of GDPR that they have to deal with right now. Of course, that's where the big ones are. That's where the ones are that have the most publicity, naturally, mm -hmm. you know, Facebook and Google and the rest of them, you know, those types of things. But I haven't really seen a lot of that, but I do know that organizations, especially multinationals, are having to work their way through understanding technically what that right to erasure means and how does it need to be proven? How does it get attested? How does the DPO handle it? Well, how does the data privacy impact assessments in the organization deal with that ability to do those things with their DPIAs, et cetera? All of things which are new to Americans, okay? And it's something that CCPA is bringing online. And so being the largest consuming state in the United States, we're gonna see it from California first which is what we saw with data breach reporting requirements too. I yeah. mean, because they are the largest consuming um, state in the country. Well, so we see that. It's the biggest country in the world by, um, by uh, output. So yeah, they, they could be, will be treated as their own country in their own right. Uh, okay. You know, I mean, if, if California had their own GDP, GDP, they'd be the sixth largest nation in the world. Yes. <laughs> Wow. Okay. So I know we, I, I wanted to follow that thread and I hope you found that interesting because, you know, there, there are, there are impacts that folks just don't realize. I mean, we, we were talking about the impact to, to companies about how do they do this? How do they enforce this? We haven't even mentioned the cost of that and the impact that that would have so. on, uh, on what, the, the company. Do they, do they stay in business? Do they, can they, can you outsource this as a function? And I think that's where Leighton touched a little earlier, right? I still think this is going to be a hunting kind of thing in terms of how they can execute this. I think, like you said, the, the fact that they're focusing on certain tenets of GDPR that they can actually achieve, that's good momentum. Um, anything they can add there is good. But we're going to run into these roadblocks, as Dasha points out. The notion of the, the, the interconnectedness country to country, at some point the cost of this becomes onerous, right? Um, and I think that's where legislatively – corporations are going to step in and say, we want to do this. We want to fulfill the spirit of this thing, but you know, it, it financially, we can't make money if we have, if that's what we have to do. I think that's going to bring those people to the table to figure out, okay, how do we do this internationally? I mean, I can give you an analog and it predates GDPR, but you know, in a, in a particular bank that was international, um, we were moving support desks around the world, right. To support, you know, do tech support from lower cost locations than higher cost locations. But, uh, um, you know, but we had to, in that particular bank, you know, we had to come up with intercompany operating agreements because they were separate legal entities to say, yeah. you know what, you know, um, the United States, you're going to be allowed to have, you know, tech support from India. India is going to allow you to do that. And you're going to allow India to do that. Uh, um, you know, Poland, that was different, but we had to come up with these, you know, where we had these centers of excellence around the world, uh, and certain centers handling, um, you know, certain geographies. Um, you know, ideally you wanted to have a whole follow the sun model, some places you could do it. You know, uh, uh, Poland was a challenge, right? Where, you know, we, nobody could support Poland, but Poland, but, you know, Poland could support the United States. So we had to come up with agreements that gets very crazy when you start dealing with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of just separate agreements yeah. to make this happen. But I could yeah. think that onerous nature of that is some, at some point is going to surface in this privacy discussion where they're going to say, We've got to come up with, we want to do this, but we've got to come up with a better way of doing this. Yeah. Um, and, and that's, I think that's going to impact change in legislation as well. It, it's, I think it's, you know, it's, going to, it's an elephant, isn't it? You've just got to eat this thing one, uh, one chunk at a time. So your point though, I mean, I've outsourced biz, business functions around the world. And the way that I did that was, uh, you know, the use of terminal services. So the data and all you got was screen refreshes and, and mouse movements back in the delivery center all of the data, all the processing was back at the mothership, wherever that, what, whichever country that was in. So, that, you know, there are te technical solutions to ease uh, some of the problems, but the fact still remains, you know, that these are quite onerous, rightfully so, onerous new requirements being placed on companies. And 
you know, collectively, we've got to figure out the best way to do this, the most effective way, and the most reasonable way. Because you know, if you were a purist and you wanted to take it to its extremes, it would be bloody expensive. So anyway, sorry. <laughs> I well, actually, that. as a follow-on to that, Robert, yeah. is vendor risk management and how do they handle your personal information yeah. from your organization? Oh, sure. As Dasha was pointing out earlier with the cloud yeah. and the advent yeah. of that literally being anywhere in the world, okay, then you've got the whole mechanism around another layer of mechanisms, yeah. not just around the personal information, but around the corporate information that is of a privacy nature that yeah, people can access yeah. in call centers or people can access when you phone in or you get online to go buy something from somebody. Where's it coming from? Who has access to the information? Yeah. Are they following the right mechanisms? And that uh, brings in the whole vendor risk management supply chain mechanism as well yeah. on top of and that. And so, like James says, it's going to end up legislatively having to be resolved in some locational efforts. You know, mm -hmm. India just passed their law about saying Indian data stays in India, yeah. you know, yesterday. So here we go again, you know, you know so similar to what's happened in at least 10 other countries around the world. Yeah. For sure. Anyone int watching this interested in this topic? A few weeks ago, we did a third party risk webinar and we covered off uh, a lot of the aspects of not all of them because we didn't we didn't wash that under the lens of GDPR or, or data privacy. But um, but yeah, this is just another thing to consider when you're considering your third party data risk. Yeah. Where is your data, guys? <laughs> I guess that's the question. All right. I, well, I enjoyed that thread, and uh, we, we've only answered, I think, one or two questions in the list. So let, let me bring us back to the list for a second. Uh, let's let me pick another interesting one. So this one seems personal to to somebody, and if if you did ask this question, then then uh, if you wanted to hold your head up and share, then or read it out yourself, that's fine. But uh, the question it, it's a it's a a little ethereal. So what do you do? when certainty melts away but your bosses still count on you to protect the company by ensuring legal requirements are met. So it feels to me like somebody's had an issue at a company where they've been left holding the baby <laughs> um, with uh, folks looking at them saying, well, you know, you, you still have to do the right thing, but the, it feels like your air cover has disappeared. Anyone want to take that one on? Does this company have Internal counsel? Just curious. I, I don't know. This is I just read the question verbatim. So I, I mean, if there's a, if there's not enough detail in the question to, to provide an answer, let me know, and I'll, I'll go to another one. So that, again, what do you do when certainty melts away, but your boss is still counts on you to protect the company by assuring legal requirements are met? Any time I've ever done anything in privacy, the first thing I go to is go talk to the lawyer. Yeah. Eh. Period. <laughs> I, I always go to the legal counsel for the organization, whatever term they happen to have, and yeah. go there because they're the ones that are going to be interpreting it for the organization. Exactly. So you have to go up to that level virtually immediately when you start working through this type of situation, um, those mechanisms. You may have technical information, you may have operational information that says that what is supposed to be being done isn't being done, but nonetheless, you still need to look at it from that privacy slash legal arena because there are so many regulations and so many laws and so many locations. You absolutely need to have a good foundation there before you can start to make any efforts anywhere else. For me, for me, it's completely agree easy. with that. Um, you know, you if you look right. at that as tech people do typically, and we're doing looking at it as a technological project or a program, uh, you've been tasked with making sure we're meeting these requirements. Um, you know, the requirements in this case are legal requirements. We should be going to the client who is legal, <laughs> right? And asking them, we're none of us are lawyers, right? We need to know what we need to deliver. And I think it, it, it becomes more like a tech project for us if we could start with the end in mind. What are the things we're gonna have to report on, right? Tell me what we're going to need to provide you with, and I think that yeah. gives 
you know, to, to Layton's point, starting at that, that's, that's starting with your customer. Let's go to legal and, and meet with them and find out what it is we have to deliver for them. Uh, then it becomes a technical challenge, uh, like any program or project for technology people on how do we deliver that. But the better you can understand the requirement of that reporting, starting with that end point in mind, if that's the end in mind, um, yeah. you know, look, we're all information people and technology people. Uh, a lot of times we don't really think about reporting up front, but this is one of those cases where reporting is everything. It's all about reporting. So, you know, starting with reporting up front is, is an important uh, important thing and meeting with that customer in that regard, if you will, or that consumer is legal in this case. So that's why I asked if they had legal counsel in the company. Right. Uh, if, you, yeah. if you don't, you know, you're, you're, you know, it's a lot of wasted effort if you don't start there. For sure. I'm loving the Covey reference, but uh, you, you're right. I guess the, the, what I take from this, if, if you've been kind of given this as a problem, um, do not, the last thing you should do is try and tackle it on your own. Get a point of view. If you've got, if you don't have legal counsel, but you have a, an external auditor or an internal auditor or somebody um, with, a, with a different point of view, you'll find the right person to speak to eventually, but don't battle on, on your own because you could be left being responsible for, for quite a sticky mess. So yeah, go and get some legal counsel or, or go talk to somebody. Yeah, for sure. I sound like uh, Hey, nobody's okay. expecting you to go to law school, <laughs> right? Um, that's not what your remit is, right? Your remit is something, you're not a lawyer. You know, that's why they're there and you should go to them. Um, although that question is a little tinge of, sounds like the manager in that case may have punted something yeah. off to say, uh, <laughs> make sure I'm covered on this. But I think that was, uh, I could sense a little bit of that in the writing, but I'm just speculating. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, these are, we have to kind of infer a little bit from the questions, but yeah, it feels like somebody's been left holding the baby and uh, yeah. I'd go track down your boss and say, hey, come on, you need to give me some more here. But uh, yeah, don't do it on your own. Okay, so uh, we've got just a quick time check. We've got 15 minutes. Um, we've covered a, a hell of a lot, but you know, focus on GDPR, and uh, and we went through <clears throat> the kind of the right to be forgotten. And if you like the what? Okay, so we've got these regulations. How do we actually work with those, and what do we do? Um, I've got a couple here that, that I'm going to come back full circle back to COVID. Uh, I know we touched on it, but I've got a couple of questions here. One is. How should we adapt our security and privacy strategy to adjust to the new working from home normal? And I think we covered a lot of that on a previous webinar, but we'll touch on it here. But then here, you know, the next question, what is data privacy going to look like in the post-COVID world? So is COVID going to have any impact whatsoever on any of our data privacy regulations or activities? Well, we're already seeing difficulties around COVID information contact tracing, all that type of information on the privacy slash health privacy scenario worldwide. Okay, and that's everybody's having issues around that. It doesn't seem to be a single country out there that's got a handle on how to handle that yet. Okay, even six months into it. Okay, on that side of it. The rest of the privacy mechanisms, I think a lot of companies have adjusted over the last six months or so um, on being able to track where certain information is going across their VPNs or whatever mechanism they're using to handle work from home scenarios, you know, individualizing devices. This is your corporate device. That's the only one that allows to come there. Therefore it's a manageable item from the company rather than doing it on your own BYOD devices um, that we've seen. Uh, we've had a lot of events where programs that maybe didn't deal with privacy have learned their lessons over the last six mm -hmm. months. And, you know, they've started putting in mechanisms generically around privacy, like Zoom, like others uh, in similar situations. So I think the big thing around privacy and COVID, I think it's the issue with COVID activities, I think is more around health information privacy at this particular point. That seems to be the biggest lacking area right now um, as they evolve it. Because of course, there's the public health considerations about contact tracing versus individual privacy on releasing somebody's 
uh, potentially positive or potentially has been in relationship with somebody that's positive just because they met them on the street, you know, whatever, you know, I think that that's the big area that I see advancing. I think that's right a fantastic now. answer. Because for me, this was a question about what is our behavior going to look like going forward? And I think with track and trace and, you know, all of a sudden that's a whole, you know, we've been moaning about Google tracking our location data for years, right? This is just that on steroids. So how do we, you know, as a, as a end consumer of that, if you like, how can I be assured that that data is only being used in the right way? And can I delete my location data? <laughs> I guess I can, but how do I do that? Um, you know, so for me, it was about behaviors. That, you know, some, some new, uh, our world has changed. Things like track and trace are now in play. If you were in three feet of somebody that all of a sudden tested positive, you get notified. That's the, the kind of theory behind it anyway. But that's a whole load of data, a whole load of people data. They've got your phone number because it's based on smartphones. Um, so they've got your name. You know, that's a that's a whole big new blob of your data up in the cloud somewhere that you would like to. And they got your public. geolocation because that's how they're yeah. actually doing the tracing. Exactly. <laughs> geolocation no, and all the rest of it. Sorry, Dasha. Consumer, you don't have to comply with that. I mean, that's your right as a consumer. So you saying it's an opt-in or out question? If you've opted in, it's 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 not a problem. Well, uh, I mean, here's the thing: you have to pay taxes and you have to die. So those are the only two things that are mandatory. Um, even on the taxes side, you get you get around it. So is it a law? Um, I mean, it's my personal data. I decide who I'm going to give my phone number to. That's my personal decision as a consumer. If, uh, if there is some kind of tracking or something and I want to be notified, fine, um, then I'll do it. But it's also the consumer's responsibility. Same thing, I, as a consumer, I have the right to not use a computer at all and do everything on paper or use VPNs or use anonymous browsing. Um, so it's it really also comes down to the consumer. It's not just a... Um, it's not just a um, responsibility of the business. I think we all kind of agreed that getting this done properly, no business is able to do anything. So if you- Can I just, bring, I just want to play devil's advocate for one, for one second, right? So you're uh, at the top 1% of, of technology users in the world, right? You understand all of this stuff, you understand the implications. To your average person on the street, it doesn't really, know that they have a choice especially some of the vocabulary that's used around some of these applications uh, they do have a choice they can say no um yeah. but they, they've almost been kind of forced into this how how, how should they feel about this because they're, they're clicking yes that would be used to things and i'm not understanding the implications no I, I don't think it's about understanding i think it's about reading it i mean seriously how many even on this group how many of us actually read all the single fine print every single time we install a software or sign up for a newsletter or something? We don't have the time. So I don't think it's, it, it's, um, it's about a choice. It's about us really be trying to be informed and staying yeah. informed. I think that's the biggest problem. That's part of it. I, I think, you know, Dash is right. I, I think, you know, there's certainly a consumer is gonna have to start to play a more active role in some of this stuff. It's not just a spectator, you know, she's absolutely right. How many people used Facebook and got on Facebook because it was a thing to do and nobody looked at how they were handling the security of your data, right? That's one of the reasons I'm not on Facebook. <laughs> I said, um, you know, I was, it was a little too loosey goosey for me that I said that that just operational security wise didn't, didn't seem to fit into where I thought I wanted to have my data. And we know now in hindsight with, with, things like, again, the social dilemma, bringing some of that awareness through a documentary and, and Cambridge Analytica, bringing awareness to that. But I'd like to think if I could be positive on some of this stuff for just yes. a second, I would like to think, um, you know, I think COVID from maybe a tactical level, you're right, it's probably not going to change a ton of stuff there. Yes, there is more data, there's health information. Um, but is COVID going to, you know, I'd like to think of it strategically, as you pointed out a little bit earlier, and as Leighton did, um, you know, 
things are going to have to change legislatively for this stuff to work internationally. I'd love to think that COVID has just given them a use case from hell as to why they need collaboration in this space, right? Mm -hmm. We need to, you know, there's no way you're going to do this without crippling companies if we keep doing it the way we're doing it right now. And frankly, it's probably, you know, data's everywhere and it's probably going to be messier if we do it that way. This mm -hmm. thing with COVID strategically, it, it should give us a use case of the importance of why there needs to be, you know, some set of standards globally, even if we could, right, uh, around how we're going to do this and not be going by country by country or state by state within a country, um, you know, uh, it's going to become too onerous and it's going to take legislation. But I also think, you know, conceivably you could see this uh, as a conversation. I don't know what the UN at some point, right? This is going to have to become an international kind of uh, way of thinking. Um, so I'd like to think that if COVID did anything good, COVID may have shined the light on that and it maybe nudges this discussion on privacy into a more global way of thinking. Fantastic. That's yes. And why not? You know, we, we have to take a positive somewhere. I think that's, that's a really good point, Jim. Thank you. It's uh, time check, five minutes to, is there anyone in the audience that um, would like to ask a different question to those that are currently in, uh, in silo, Slido? Is that to open the floor up a little bit? Oh, Jim Ferenberg there with his palm trees. He's, uh, he's normally good for a question or two. I like to always look like I'm on vacation, even if I'm not. <laughs> yeah, your life's one big vacation, Jim. <laughs> uh, vacations are over for quite a while, unfortunately. Okay. Can't go anywhere. Right. Nobody will take Americans. True. Let me, uh, okay, let me just get one more question from the list. We've got five minutes. Let's, let's, let's pick a quick one. So... Yeah, they're all, they're, we've, we've covered the themes. I mean, I've got some particular ones. We've covered COVID and working from home and what does that look like? And um, we, we covered, all right, let, let, let's just underline one of the main themes here, which was around, um, if you like, international data transfers. So for companies in the EU, how does one expect a company to review all its data transfers outside of the EU? I guess this comes to the latest point, you know, the, the example he used was the kind of three data centers controlling all the others, like Lord of the Rings, right, with, a, with an overarching kind of thing. Um, did you want to go into any more detail with that? Well, one of the things we did first was to set all the legal requirements out on the table so we knew which ones were compatible and which ones weren't. Yeah. So literally country by country by country first. And, you know, what were the major areas of transmissions of data by looking at what data was, uh, what Dasha was talking about, what data models and data mechanisms are showing where there were the interchanges within the organization. All right. And then where were the interchanges from outside the organization that had major influence on major customers of the um, company. And so in looking at those, we first had to do a identification mechanism about what was there, where was it, what was covered. And so, you know, that effort involved everybody in the data protection arena. It included operational people and included legal uh, from day one. Fortunately for us, they had a very large legal department, so they worked with us on that. And um, you know, that happened to be one of their lines of business. So they actually had people who were conversant in technical and technology law. And so um, we got lucky that way. I mean, I've worked with other organizations where, you know, they don't, <laughs> certainly. Yeah. Um, and those types of things. And then once we can identify where it is and what it is and what covers it, then you can start to create a model around how do you handle it. But you got to do the first big piece, which is identify where all the pieces are, mm -hmm. what is covering those because of all the data protection laws around the world. Right now, it's about where it is more than who owns it as to what legal coverage is, as the lawyers were telling us over and over and over again, is about where it is physically, what data center, where is it, 
that's first, all right, uh, as far as those mechanisms go, um, and those laws take precedence. And it doesn't matter who owns the data, it's where it is first. And that was the big understanding that came out right away, right. is when we start looking at those things. So, so to summarize that, because it's a really good point, you need three things, I believe. You need to know where it is, yep. you need a conversation map, you know, if, yep. in the old ways of setting up a firewall, you know, you need to understand what the flows are of that data internationally or, or, or from, the, from an enterprise perspective. And then you have to look at all of that through the legal lens by country. I think uh -huh. if you can get those three things together, then you stand a chance of being able to answer the question. You at least start the process. <laughs> right, because you need to layer in your third party connections and all of that, but that, that comes into where it is. So, all right, we are at the top of the hour. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Uh, if anyone has a quick comment they want to make, please, uh, please make it now. Otherwise, I'm going to wrap the call. I can't believe this is the last one of these things. I just want to say thank you to everybody here. I, you know, I know I've gotten more out of these than I've contributed, so I can't thank you all enough. <laughs> Leighton, you know, Dasha, your folks have been great. Emmy, you're the you're the one putting all of this stuff together. Thank you for for all your efforts in this. This has been these have been great forums. Thank you okay. for your involvement. I didn't, I didn't I didn't understand this was the last one. I think we were still doing more of these, no? Um, we're gonna revamp them, but no, this is the last scheduled one right now. But okay. we're gonna do podcast. Okay, so Jim, look out for podcast. You're all you guys get okay. invitation. Um, we will do the odd special when you know when something topical comes up. Uh, so yeah, we, this isn't the last one, and you will be coming back, please. So, of this format, I should have I should have said. Uh, okay. <laughs> so so thank you to all of our panelists, past and present. Thank you to everyone that's contributed. Thanks to everyone that's joined in. I hope you found it informative. I hope you took something away that was or answered a question that you that you couldn't get answered anywhere else. Um, that's it. As I say, I'm not going to sell you anything. We're going to wrap it here. Look out for our podcast is all I'm going to say because they're going to be fantastic. emmy has got a real, uh, a real uh, excitement about doing those. So, so look out for invitations. And, uh, and that's a wrap. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining.